Welcome to the Green Building Show, where we investigate green design and building trends throughout Australia. This week, we continue our investigation in disaster design. I'll be speaking with research scientist Justin Leonard with the CSIRO, who's done extensive research on building and designing a home for a fire-prone area. In Australian style, we profile a lightweight, energy-efficient and award-winning home on the outskirts of Adelaide. And this week's What's Hot, Mark Jones will bring us the Light Home Hot Design blog. Bushfires are a common threat for many Australians. This week on the Green Building Show, we'll be taking a look at the best way to design and build for a bushfire-prone area. Joining us today is Justin Leonard. He's a project leader for bushfire research at CSIRO's Sustainable Ecosystems. Thanks for being with us, Justin. That's a pleasure. All right, so first off, Justin, how does someone go about identifying and assessing the bush, bushfire risk for, for their site? Well, it's, uh, it's really a case of, um, of uh, being able to consult with your local fire agencies and they can advise on how severe the, uh, the fire behaviour could be um, near your site and then to understand the, uh, the distance you, you, you are from, from that fuel load and that will give you an idea of how much radiant heat and, um, and of course, how much ember attack you might expect on your site. Okay. And, is, and are sites, you know, are some sites, in your, your personal opinion, a real a nightmare? Is there, is there some sites that you would personally avoid or can any site be, be adapted to be, you know, safe? Well, obviously, the, the more severe the uh, fire exposure on a site, the, the more difficult it is to uh, effectively locate and build a house that's going to survive. So I've certainly seen sites that range from getting a, a very minor ember attack right through the radiant heat exposure spectrum right up to full flame immersion where you can it's obvious that the flames are actually going to reach or contact the house no matter where you put it on the site. Right, so there's some sites you would personally avoid? Well, there is a design solution for uh, every every occasion, but uh, the effort you need to put into designing something to withstand flame zone and the, um, and, uh, the fact that you have very limited options once um, you've, uh, you're attempting to, say, shelter in a house that's, uh, that's in a flame zone scenario, um, I definitely... My first choice would be to avoid those kind of types of sites, yeah. Okay, great. And you've mentioned in a previous CSIRO article that it's actually ember attacks rather than direct contact with um, the flames that causes the greatest damage to homes throughout Australia. Um, but you've also said that the ember attack is also the easiest thing to counter with um, design elements. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what these design measures are? Yeah, sure. So, um, em ember attack is certainly the mo most prolific attack mechanism, but it's really just a combination of fine um, debris that's blowing in the wind that uh, is yet to burn, as well as burning and smouldering debris that's that's landing um, on and around your your structure. So we find that it it uh, attacks the house in a number of ways. It can enter through small gaps and sort of ignite the interior of your house or a cavity space or it can sort of build up on um, horizontal projections and, and little inclusions around your house and, and um, attack your house as small flame sources. So the best way to sort of uh, mitigate that kind of risk is to make sure there's no gaps in your em building envelope and that any sort of small details where you can typically see leaves build up, um, that, that those surfaces are, are not combustible. So if a, if a flame was to occur in those locations, it wouldn't ignite your facade or your deck and start to burn. Right, OK. So basically you're saying that you have to... Um, basically you have to seal up the home completely in order to um, stop the embers getting into those little gaps and stuff that you mentioned. However, does that not um, impact on, you know, perhaps the home's thermal performance and cross-ventilation? Well, yeah, you'd certainly get a negative impact from the amount of sort of uh, ventilation for moisture control you might you might have in the house, but um, your thermal performance would improve um, by closing things up like that. But if you need to maintain ventilation and ember protection at the same time, then people commonly use um, mesh screening 
to uh, to allow airflow but to, to limit to limit embryometry and the mesh really has to be sort of smaller than two millimeters to be effective. Okay, all right, fantastic. And is implementing these kind of measures going to mean extra cost to a project's budget? Um, well, ember attack, I, I would certainly put into the to the to, to the very minor sort of uh, cost impact area. And in fact, most of the things you're doing to meet uh, the thermal performance objectives of um, current star-rated homes um, tick the box also for, for ember. So I'd say that if you're starting from scratch, you you probably wouldn't notice the implementation of uh, ember mitigation in your in your budget. All right, great. And in your in your opinion, Justin, what do you think are some you know what are a few fire protection techniques or methods that aren't that perhaps aren't commonplace in Australia or in the common Australian home, but you think should be? Um, oh, there's lots of little fine details that that we find in our post bushfire surveys that seem to have made quite a bit of difference to to survival of some homes. Um, things like uh, using silicon to um, seal your glass into your window frames um, helps hold the glass in place even if the windows crack. <clears throat> um, and, you know, various ranges of, um, of simple uh, shutter systems that can close over windows and doors to offer further protection, sort of an obvious um, easy fix for a lot of existing houses and new house builds. All right, great. And what's your take on, on building building standards and fire standards, Justin, is there, is there a lot of convolution throughout Australia or is there some some pretty simple guidelines that, that um, builders can follow or homeowners can follow? Um, well, I, I'd encourage everyone to, to sort of um, follow the, the regulations that are enforced in their area, but certainly then um, take on the, the task of, of understanding bushfire itself and going a couple of steps further than what the regulations provide. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's planning regulations and building regulations that try to work together to um, provide a, a good solution, but there's obviously many gaps in those, um, in those regulatory instruments that are left to the, the homeowners to um, consider and resolve. Right. So, uh, and do, these, and do these building regulations um, impact on the, on material choices? Um, but they provide um, guides to which materials you should um, go for and avoid. But, uh, yeah, you certainly want to think as broadly as possible when thinking about overall materials. And I'd sort of think of your whole build as a, as a complete system. For instance, if you, if you choose a, uh, a timber-framed house, um, you then need to be a bit more robust in your selection of, of cladding um, to protect that timber frame as of, if you go for something like a steel framed house, you, um, you don't have the problem of, say, internal cavity fires mm -hmm. um, um, causing issues for your structure. Justin, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. What's the hot design vlog this week, Mark? Uh, so this week we found the Design Files, which is uh, the brainchild of Lucy Feagans. Uh, she is an ex-set designer that's turned a blogger, and she features on her blog um, some fantastic imagery as well as some interviews with Australia's top designers and creatives, um, featuring everything uh, from home design to interior design. Back in 2009, Lucy was featured in the UK Times uh, Top 50 Design Blogs, um, and since then she's now receiving 120,000 uh, unique visitors per month to her website, and you can catch her website at thedesignfiles.net. I'm here today with John Maitland. He's the director of Adelaide-based design firm Energy Architecture. Thanks for being with us, John. Oh, you're welcome. Great, and we're here today. We're talking about an award-winning remote wonder, which is a which is a home that you built, situated in the Aldinga Arts Eco Village in South Adelaide. Yep. Well, John, just tell us. I mean, this is quite an unusual site to be building on and designing for. Can you tell us? I guess what's the fundamental difference between designing for an eco village setting or just a regular block in a regular suburb? Um, well, I guess in essence, there really is no difference. But the the 
the uh, Aldingarats eco village, like other eco villages, requires people to build in a particularly energy efficient way. So, um, the point of difference for the Aldingarats eco village is the fact that there was a requirement to do that, and the requirement was established by a set of bylaws which I wrote in the process of designing and building the eco village uh, back in 2000 plus. Um, so all houses that are built in the village are required to be at least reasonably energy efficient to comply with the bylaws. Okay, and, and, and how did the Aldinga house stack up in terms of sustainability? Uh, what features does it, um, what features helps to lower its environmental impact and, yeah. and how does that well, affect the lifestyle for the occupants? Yep. In answer to your first part of the question, how did it stack up? It stacked up particularly well. The occupants um, who required a very energy efficient house as part of their brief um, were also connected with the University of Adelaide who monitored it and the monitoring, which is independent of course of the, of the owners, has very clearly indicated how well it performs. The features that enable it to perform well, they're fundamentally all of the six basic elements of energy efficiency are there and orientation being the first part. Um, clearly lots of glass facing north, um, protective glass as well, shaded from the summer sun. We have a, a polycarbonate um, uh, conservatory built on the eastern face of the building, which is actually formed uh, there as the heater. Uh, the built form itself is uh, what we call reverse brick veneer, so there's a lot of thermal mass material built on the inside of a wall frame that is then clad. And the cladding on the outside um, comprises some Hardy's Hardy Tex uh, in the main, which we, which we were able to coat and colour uh, as a homogenous, continuous, sort of seamless skin. Uh, which gave it a particular architectural form, which we're really happy with, and we're able to paint it in a really deep blue, uh, despite the fact that that absorbs the heat. Uh, systems that protect the house from that heat in summer are the frame that it's built on, which is fully insulated, the thermal mass on the inside is protected from any heat load on the outside, and the insulation, of course, contains the heat within the building during winter, and the sun is able to shine on the conservatory and through the northern glass in winter to keep the warmth up to the house. So it actually requires no heating at all through winter that is Fantastic. artificial, and similarly no cooling in summer. Great. John Maitland, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Justin did a great job explaining the fundamentals of fire design. However, he did have a limited time frame. And if you wanted to know some more about this complex issue, I'd recommend visiting the CSIRO website where they've got heaps of information exactly on this topic. <laughs>